We are here in front of the Tricastin nuclear center. We can see the water vapor getting out of the cooling towers of the enrichment plant. And we also see the two chimneys of the nuclear plant, very small chimneys. So we are measuring the level of gamma radiation here. We can see that it's um, a little bit below 200 counts per second, which is already abnormal. But if I move my body, my body is no more stopping the gamma radiation coming from those uh, drums containing uranium. And the level of radiation is increasing. It's about 270 counts per second. So our bodies are stopping a little bit those radiation, which means that the energy they send in the air is creating damage in our body. If we go closer, those drums are containing uranium and they are sending gamma radiation into the air around, closer to the gamma emitting source. So now we have more than 300 counts per second. This level of radiation is about four times above natural value in this area, which is 70 or 60 counts per second. So the people who live around here receive gamma radiation from the uh, radioactive material which is stored on this uh, site. Isn't it like a chemical? Yeah, it's like a chemical, isn't it? No, I don't know what it is. Well, it's, it's a country. <laughs> it's a country. <laughs> no. It is like, isn't it like a bit like plutonium? Yeah. <laughs> is it? Like some sort of explosive or something like that. Uranium? Uranium? What's that? <laughs> A nuclear uh, thing? I don't know in English what it's called. Ancient's a nice thing, I might say. It's used for good and for bad. That's the stuff that they make nuclear, nuclear stuff out of? Yeah, uh, that's dangerous. <laughs> Uranium? How you mean? really really careful because we are dealing with uranium. On the corner here is emergency services. On the right this is where our big medical center is. drums of uranium just in there in that uh, sea container. We pour that black powder into those drums. They're 34 gallon drums or 205 litre drums and we strap each one into those sea containers individually. We put 48 in a sea container. We seal it. We put the stickers on the outside and it's ready to go down to Adelaide.
no one knows enough about it, you know, especially up here, they're not familiar because all that stuff's all new stuff to, to the people that are living up within this area. And when mining companies do come in to the towns to talk about and advise the communities of, you know, what's going to happen, they don't tell you the potential dangers of that mining, they tell you all the good things that's going to happen. What about three, four, four big uranium mining within a radius of 50 kilometres or hundred, well, Rock Street's about a hundred from here, but if you go to the east, you're probably looking at 50 kilometres. Uh, so, so within a radius of 150 kilometres, you've got about three or four big mines, uranium mining, that's going to happen. Any mineral, any minerals or anything like that was seen by Aboriginal people as poison and they never touched that, they never went near that. There's always stories <coughs> that, uh, and they're, they're terrible stories, a bad story, saying that you shouldn't go near that place because that is a bad place, that place is poisonous. Australia is one of the world's major suppliers of uranium. Uh, Australia is very prospective for uranium uh, and we have pretty good prospects um, for increasing the number of mines. Uh, Australia exports about 10,000 tonnes of uranium a year. In 2006-2007 the export value of that was about $586 million. Uh, it's forecast to grow to $972 million in this financial year uh, and to about $1.3 billion a year um, by 2011-2012. Uranium, in our eyes, is a very special mineral. It's unlike any other mineral on Earth. It's linked to the production of the world's worst industrial waste, and it's linked to the creation, the spread, the proliferation of the world's worst ever weapons. So, from an Australian perspective, as a country that holds around 35 or 40 per cent of the world's uranium, the thing that we are hoping to do, and the, and the thing that we see as our responsibility, and the best thing we could do for the world is keep the genie in the bottle. The Australian Bureau of Agriculture and Resource Economics has identified 15 to 20 uh, uh, uranium prospects which could potentially become mines uh, in the next 10 or 15 years. So Australia is very prospective for uranium. Australia is one of the world's major suppliers of uranium. Um, people want our product, they're going to keep wanting it. The British have just committed to, to the nuclear power industry for at least another 70 years. So um, people want our product and we can supply it. What we're looking for here is bush onion. And bush onion will grow in this soft area like that. Like this here is pretty soft, soft ground, see? So you would know in an area, if you're looking for bush onion, you would look in an area like this. And uh, if it's a bit hard, sometimes you'll find a bit clay. But you have a rock and you beat that ground. See? In the nuclear industry, the first step is uranium mining. The companies have to get uranium ore from the soil and to put it at the surface. This is uranium mining. Then this uranium ore has to be crushed and the uranium element has to be get out of the ore. It is called an uranium mill. And you push the dirt away and then this is how you find bush onions. Can you see those two little bush onions there? So that's what you're digging for. This will produce yellow cake, which is uranium concentrate. It will then go to a conversion plant.
to change this uranium into a gas UF6. Here's another one, there's a big one, see? See, that's what you call bush onion. Bush onion, see? Bush onion we call yalka. So then, you have a plant that will use this gas, UF6, to convert it again into uranium metal and prepare the powder, and which will be compressed and heated to make the small pellets and to prepare the fuel, the rod. Well, what you do is you peel it like that, see? You can cook them, you can cook them in the ashes. After this fuel fabrication, the fuel will go to the nuclear plant and you will have there the nuclear reactions and this fuel will become highly, highly radioactive. It's called spent fuel. And you always, the important thing is, with the same as everything else, the old people say to you, well, if you dig that out, you've got to cover it back in again, fill it back in again, see? Fill it back in. So the rest of the bush onion in there will be there. So then you have the management of the waste, spent fuel, other kind of low-level waste, and all the industry of how to manage those radioactive waste. Obviously, the link between all those steps is transportation by train, by truck, by plane. I say this in my Aravana language. Yalka, Yalka, Niki, Charpa, Ngurku. What I'm saying there, this bush onion is very good food. The Western society, it's, it's about now, rather than the long, uh, the long term. It's what we can do now, what we can hoard up now, what treasures and, and wealth we can hoard up. I think the, the people from the Western world don't realize that and don't understand that by doing what they're doing to the lands, polluting and damaging that land, they're actually doing that to themselves in the long term. Yeah, but I'm saying you, this is my grandmother's country and my great-grandmother's country and my mother's country. I was born here, grew up here, lived here all my life, never left here, been here all my life. Now it's like the back of my hand. Yeah. God's own country. Woo! <laughs> We have real concerns in Australia about the long-term impacts of uranium mining. The long-term social impacts, the long-term cultural impacts on Indigenous people, obviously the long-term environmental impacts from leaking tailings dams and from contaminated water. We also have concerns about the long-term financial impacts because what we've found so often across the mining sector in Australia is that uh, mining companies quickly form, quickly identify uh, deposits of whatever that mineral that's in demand is. They access it, process it, sell it, and then they finish. And what we have is a funny situation. We have a legal requirement and a legal recognition in some of the authorities and guidelines and regulations about uranium mining that says the mining company has a responsibility for 10,000 years to isolate and contain radioactive tailings at mines. The mining industry says it'll all be okay It'll all be good, trust us, it'll be clean and safe, we'll all get jobs, we'll all get rich. And then we look at the reality of the mining industry. We look at a reality of leaks and spills. We look at a reality of secrecy and denial. We see a reality of underperformance and cover-up. We see a reality of a lack of responsibility and of company after company walking away from their long-term responsibilities. So it's one thing, the words are one thing, the actions are another. And the actions also have to be measured over the length of the threat. And the threat is thousands of years at least. It all began the year that I was born, back in 1955. They started processing uranium from a radium hill. The site operated from about 1955 um, to 1960. And then um, it went into receivership. And then they started processing mineral sands 
and uh, that was operating until about 1962. The company then um, parted ways with Port Pirie but left the site as it was so it was unfixed and there were six tailing stands left there. And so the local children used to play and swim in those tailing stands with the radioactive waste. And then uh, in the 1970s a local group of the Friends of the Earth was formed and they campaigned very heavily to have the site fenced and to have radioactive signs put up. Mining companies can say whatever they want. Politicians can say whatever they want. In a decade, they won't be a politician anymore. In two decades, they won't be a mining company anymore. In four decades, they won't be alive anymore. Against the spectrum of 10,000 years of threat, their promises are pretty hollow. I really did like it there, you know, like living in Kakadu National Park, virtually. So, you know, I liked it. I liked the fishing. I liked my kids, you know, it was good, good school. And, yeah, just come home. M mainly because of family, really, because it's a long way away. Yeah. About 18 months after I come home, I um, started forgetting things and, you know, leaving things everywhere and uh, getting run down so I went and seen the doctor and uh, had some blood tests and I've got hairy cell leukemia which I've you know had to have um, chemo and had my spleen out and and luckily enough I'm still here today so yeah but not so lucky for my boss that I work for he died and his brother died. Uh, I mean, these are, and one of the plant operators died. And these are just um, the two brothers that I worked with. They were younger than I was, and I was just surprised to hear that, you know, they died from from a cancer. There were protesters there protesting against it, but you know, because I was young and naive, I didn't, you know, didn't think anything of it. It was just a job. You know, if you were getting half as much money or um, $800 a week, you'd be thinking, mm, you know, maybe I should be joining, maybe I should be doing this, you know, maybe I shouldn't be, you know, exposing myself to some health risks. But when you're being paid probably three or four times as much as that, well, you think, oh, okay, it'll be all right for a little while and then I'll, I'll give it up. I'll go and do something else. At the moment we're about five and a half thousand people. We'll grow to ten, maybe twelve thousand people. We have a, a cemetery in Roxby Downs with nobody in it. And that cemetery has been in existence for about 18 years and there's still no one in it. The mine's been very important for South Australia. It's created a lot of employment, but uh, I think the mine, BHP Billiton, is very proactive in trying to make sure that whatever they're doing this is going to also enhance our environment. They're not here to be uh, doing what they can and, and exploiting or, or creating problems environmentally. They actually have a big team of people making sure that everything they do is done the right way so they can leave less of an impact upon our environment, which I think is great. I don't 
don't work for BHP Billiton. Um, I work for local government, as I said, but I do know that BHP Billiton uh, are, are fanatical almost on safety. I don't wish to to blow, um, sing BHP Bulletin's praises, but it's a fact. They, they, they are, everything they do, they're trying to make sure that it's going to come, come at a, you know, less of an impact damage, uh, be more, hopefully, a, a chance to mine, but also to be respectful of, of the resources around them, natural resources, and so I think they're doing that. Well, apparently they, uh, there was some yellow cake found in the township in containers, but I'd know nothing about that. That's only what I heard, so I really couldn't comment on that because um, if um, if that happened, um, that's absolutely you know, BHP Bulletin would be absolutely you know, screaming with the shock and and. I don't know, I've never heard that, I've only, I can't say I've heard it, I've heard it on, on a grapevine, but not factual, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. But, um, yeah, I find it hard to believe, but, um, um, again, I don't work for BHP Billiton, and I've got no reason to defend them, but I do know, as I said before, the safety procedures are uh, extremely important to them, and if that ever did happen, there would be serious ramifications without doubt yeah but i don't know it's only been a grapevine thing i, I couldn't say that's a, a fact mm. This is 
the lifeline to the mine, six metres down below us. Without this pipeline, that mine could not exist. And that's coming from the Great Artesian Basin. Without this pipeline here, that, that mine could not survive. At the moment, the mine draws on the Great Artesian Basin for its water supply. Uh, it, in fact, uses about three quarters of, the, uh, of its allowable, um, allowable uh, arrangement. It doesn't draw all that it has to do. And what the, what the studies of that show and what the regulation of that shows is that, um, is that, the, great, is that the Great Artesian Basin, Basin is sustainable. Notwithstanding, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the Olympic Dam draws on it for its water supply. The only thing about that is that it's the mining company themselves who do the monitoring and collect all the data. And if they want to manipulate that data, they can, because no one else sees it. If there's an impact on the basin, you wouldn't know, because they're not going to tell you that anyhow, because it's their livelihood that's threatened. Yeah. So that's water that's coming out of the Great Artesian Basin. Yeah. And uh, I suppose you call it artificial. Down the track, we'll see natural water escaping from the Great Artesian Basin in the mound springs and that. So uh, it's amazing to look at this dry and this arid looking land you wouldn't expect to find so much water below what there is. Yeah. Again, the, 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 uh, the uh, changes since the, since the mining, mining you've got a depression as you'll see in there, see there's a depression? In the past you didn't have that, there was a, there was a level filling across there rather than a depression. Aboriginal people who live in the area have absolutely noticed that natural springs and natural outlets for Great Artesian Basin water called mound springs, which have been really important both culturally and for ceremony significance, they're drying up, flow rates are reduced. These are significant impacts and the appetite for water at the Olympic Dam mine is only increasing. The Olympic Dam mine, owned by the world's largest mining company BHP Billiton, every day sucks up at least 35, 32, 35 million litres of water every day. Without cost, it sucks that up free from ancient fossil groundwater reserves. If you get this uranium and you bring it at the surface, the companies will make a sort of selection. The most active rocks will be sent to the uranium mill that will prepare yellow cake, uranium concentrate, but they will leave a lot of radioactive mud called tailings. Remember that uh, that tailings are a problem with not a, tailings are an issue with all mines. So you have you have to manage tailings with all mines, and you have to manage tailings with uranium mines as well. And the two ways of doing that are either to uh, build what are called tailings dams, uh, which at the end of the life of the mine are capped with with ore and made safe. Um, and or secondly, to put the tailings back into the into the mine and and cover them over. Our, both of those ways are both best practice uh, and, um, uh, and environmental best practices, engineering best practice and, env and environmental best practice.
that they have the composition of powder. It's readily eroded by wind or by water, and those tailings are going to remain hazardous for thousands of years. Uh, the volume is so large that the company don't intend to, they intend to leave it on the surface and not move it. You know that they're looking to just leave it on site. Some people say that tailings are benign or neutral and that they're not a problem. Tailings are in fact uh, uh, less radioactive and less dangerous than the, the materials from which, they, from which they come because the uranium oxide, the uranium ore, has been, has been extracted. The absolute reality of tailings is that they contain 75 to 80 percent of the original radioactivity of the ore body. The only radioactive element that is taken out in the process is uranium 308, which is one of a host of elements. And that material, which was previously secure and inert, has now been broken up and mobilised. Tailings are a profoundly serious environmental management problem. Those who downplay the seriousness of this problem either have not read the technical detail or they have read that technical detail and they've decided that that's not as important as the profit bottom line. Um, uranium mining in Australia is heavily regulated. It's heavily scrutinised. There are laws at the, the national level. Uh, there are laws governing um, uh, environmental protection at the national level. There are laws governing environmental protection at the state level. Uh, there are laws governing the mining of uranium and the transport of uranium. We are trying to uh, overtake this truck which is transporting uranium from the concentration plant to the enrichment plant and probably when we will overtake him we will uh, measure excess radiation in our car. So at the moment the level of radiation is normal about 60 counts per second but when we will cross overtake the, the truck we might measure an excess of radiation. It's much higher than the natural radiation level, which is about less than 100.
So at the moment we measure 1,600 counts per second, which is very high compared to natural radiation, which is below 100. And you will see that the level of radiation will decrease because we are getting away from the radioactive truck. So now we don't measure any excess radiation from this truck. In France, we had approximately 200 uranium mines. Today, they are all closed, but the contamination is still there. So we checked, I would say, approximately 20 of those uranium mines in France, and we discovered the same problems everywhere. Water contamination, sediments in lakes and rivers contamination, aquatic plants contamination, uh, the fact that radioactive rocks from the mine have been reused even for build, constructing buildings or roads, and the problems are the same at all different mines. CURAD means Commission for Research and Independent Information about Radiation. So it's an NGO which has been created in 1986, just after the Chernobyl accident, because the French government said that in France we had absolutely no contamination from Chernobyl, which was wrong. So a group of people decided to set up this organization to hire scientists, to buy equipment, and to create an independent laboratory. So our action is to make measurements and to improve people's knowledge, people's awareness about the problems linked with radiation in the environment, radiation at home, radiation at the hospital, and obviously nuclear energy and its impact. You know, those radiations, alpha, beta, gamma, they carry a lot of energy. For example, a typical gamma radiation will have an energy of, for example, one million electron volts, while the visible light from the sun has an energy of one or two or three electron volts. So those radiations, ionizing radiations, they carry a lot of energy. You know that if you spend too much time exposed to solar rays, you can get skin cancer. So you can imagine that if you receive those alpha, beta, gamma radiation, which are much more powerful, they can create breaks in our DNA and increase the risk of cancer. Es gibt historische Gründe für die Ablehnung der Atomenergie, die sind nach wie vor richtig, zum Teil sogar verschärft. Das ist die Frage der unzureichenden Entsorgung. Das ist die Frage der Risiken, wobei bei Atomenergie nicht die Frage der Eintrittswahrscheinlichkeit das Entscheidende ist, sondern der mögliche Schadensumfang. Jede Risikoanalyse hat immer zwei Komponenten, also die Eintrittswahrscheinlichkeit, die ist sicherlich geringer als beispielsweise ein stehen gebliebener Fahrstuhl, aber auf der anderen Seite ist dafür die andere Komponente so gewichtig, nämlich die möglichen Folgen, dass eben die zweite Komponente, die genauso wichtig ist, umso mehr zum Tragen kommt. Der dritte Punkt ist der militärische Missbrauch. Und der vierte, der in den letzten Jahren verstärkt dazugekommen ist, 
ist der terroristische Missbrauch, äh, der vielfältige Komponenten hat, die anfangen von Atomüberfällen äh, äh, durch beispielsweise Terroristen bis hin zu der Frage gezielter Flugzeugabstürze. Äh, Die Atomenergie ist für meine Begriffe nicht das, was es sein soll. Sie äh, bringt uns viel Unheil. Letztendlich ist ja doch immer der Mensch äh, dabei, der das praktisch entscheiden muss, Knöpfe drückt. Also ich finde schon, dass das absolut sicher ist. Ich habe mir auch mal eins angeschaut mit der Schule. Ich finde das schon. Also es ist okay. Gründe für Atomenergie. Ich kann Ihnen ja keine sagen. Der Bau von Atomkraftwerken ist im hohen Maß subventioniert worden in Deutschland. Und nach etwa 15, 16 Jahren, nach unserer Einschätzung, ist ein Atomkraftwerk, vielleicht bei nach 18, aber das ist die höchste Frist, die ich kenne, ist ein Atomkraftwerk abgeschrieben. Und danach verdient man verdammt viel Geld mit dem Atomkraftwerk. Und insofern ist das eigentliche Interesse nicht der Neubau, sondern alte Anlagen, solange es geht, zu nutzen. Gründe. Das ist am billigsten, das denke ich mir mal. Ja, es gibt Studien, die das berechnen. Diese Studien existieren und sagen, dass es circa eine Million Euro pro Tag sind, die ein Betreiber durch das Weiterlaufen der Atomkraftwerke hier gewinnt. Und die Energieversorger können sehr teuren Strom zurzeit verkaufen, weil an der Leipziger Börse der Strompreis sehr viel höher ist. Und das wird aber den Verbrauchern in Rechnung gestellt, sodass ein Atomkraftwerk schon wirklich ein, eine sehr preisgünstige Variante für den jetzigen Energieversorger ist. Viele Verbraucher interessiert das gar nicht. Also ob sie jetzt erneuerbare Energie nutzen oder ob sie Atomenergie nutzen. Der Verbraucher merkt ja nicht, was er aus der Steckdosen rauskriegt. Ich finde es gut, weil es ist billiger Strom. Ja, das ist am billigsten ist. Zur Zeit. Tatbestand ist, wenn man sich die nächsten 15 Jahre sich anguckt, werden erneuerbare Energien auf jeden Fall preiswerter, traditionelle Energieformen teurer. Und äh, spätestens also Jahre 2020 werden die Erneuerbaren im Schnitt preisgünstiger sein. Also alternative Energien ist äh, ein Schlagwort, das eigentlich nicht mehr zeitgemäß ist. Wir haben im Wesentlichen, die äh, Energiewirtschaft äh, hat sich im Wesentlichen der Ressourcen an Kohle, an Öl und an Gas bedient. Das muss zurückgehen, weil diese Ressourcen verschwinden. Und dann gibt es Möglichkeiten dreierlei Art. Das eine und bei weitem interessanteste, aber am wenigsten populäre ist, weniger Energie zu verbrauchen. Das ist auch ein technisches Problem. Es ist nicht nur dass man sein eigenes Verhalten verändert, sondern das ist ein ganz großes Potenzial. So dass jede Kilowattstunde, die ich nicht verbrauche, brauche ich nicht mit fossilen Energien oder auch nicht mit Atomstrom oder auch nicht mit Windstrom zu füllen. Das zweite ist der ganze Bereich der erneuerbaren Technologien, der jetzt in starkem Maße in Gang kommt. Wir haben also hier in Deutschland inzwischen etwa halb so viel, wie wir Atomstrom haben, schon Strom an erneuerbaren Energien. Und das dritte wäre die Atomenergie, deren weltweite Bedeutung wesentlich geringer inzwischen ist als die der erneuerbaren Energien. Das heißt hier, die, das Schlagwort alternative Energien führt in die Irre, weil das zeigt so an, ja das ist etwas, was vielleicht irgendwie funktionieren könnte. Nein, das kommt im großen Stil.
Wir haben eine intensive Debatte beispielsweise in der Enquete-Kommission des Deutschen Bundestages schon in den 80er Jahren, Ende der 80er Jahre gehabt. Und damals war die Kommission mehrheitlich besetzt von Befürwortern der Atomenergie, äh, unter anderem auch durch Professor Michaelis, der in Deutschland das äh, Handbuch für die Kernenergie geschrieben hat, also sozusagen einer der Hauptmotoren für die Kernenergie. Und äh, wir haben uns mit der Frage beschäftigt, kann die Atomenergie das Klimaproblem lösen? Und das Ergebnis dieser Kommission, die wie gesagt mehrheitlich aus Befürwortern bestanden hat, war einstimmig. Die Atomenergie kann das nicht. Gut, ich persönlich äh, fand sie einfach kitschig, die Kampagne. Und ich glaube, äh, dafür ist auch viel zu viel im Kopf drin, was in den letzten 20 Jahren passiert ist dass ein paar glücklich äh, schauende Kühe vor dem Atomkraftwerk nicht unbedingt die Sache verniedlichen können. All die Herren, die jetzt so tun, als sei der Klimaschutz was Neues, waren alle schon in den 90er Jahren in den Debatten beteiligt. Wir haben bei den Ausstiegsverhandlungen die gesamte Klimaproblematik mitbehandelt. Das Problem ist nur, dass die Politik jetzt in der Hand dieser Konzerne ist. reagiert, vor allen Dingen, insbesondere in Demokratien, die Gott sei Dank haben wir einen, auf das, äh, was Wahlen betrifft. Und wenn die Menschen sich wehren gegen die Atomenergie, weil hier das Atomkraftwerk daneben ist, dann fängt die Politik an, sich darauf, äh, daran zu orientieren. Das war in Deutschland der Fall, das hat da, dazu geführt, dass in der rot-grünen Koalition der Atomausstieg sich durchgesetzt werden konnte, von dem nicht sicher ist, dass er wirklich dann funktioniert. Aber wenn die Menschen hier in diesem Lande überhaupt nicht spüren, was an äh, Umweltschädigungen im australischen Busch passiert, dann gibt es auch keine Rückwirkung auf die Politik. So ist die Welt gestrickt.